Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's nice to see some faces here that we don't see very often. And uh, really nice to see you back. And your guest. Let's pray. Father God, we, we love you and we thank you that you're in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would be present here in a, in a felt way today. That we will feel your presence in our lives, feel your presence in the service, Lord. That it won't be like we're just sitting in pews or, or in a church building, God, but that we will be in your throne room. Father, I pray that you will teach us and guide us, that we will see your heart today for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and you desire a relationship. Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Looking at this group of people, I, I'm always impressed about the fact that how, in many ways, a youthful congregation we have. There are a few of us who are not so youthful, but, but most of you guys are pretty youthful. Let me ask you, how many of you were alive in the 1970s. Raise your hands. So put your hand down, climb. Raise, 1970s, raise it high if you were alive in the 1970s. Yeah, like four or five of us here, okay? If you were alive in the early 1970s and more than just uh, a little kid, the big news was Watergate major scandal with the President of the United States. I mean, some of the things we're seeing now pale in comparison to how big a news this was. It was the President was going to be impeached. It was a terrible, terrible time in the United States. A guy working, as, as much as Nixon was hated at this time period and just crucified in the media, Second was a guy by the name of Charles Colson. Charles Colson was known as Nixon's hatchet man. In an internal memo, he had once said, I would walk over my grandmother for Richard Nixon. This man was considered to be the evil genius behind Watergate, even though, really, he had not very much to do with it. The media said that he was supposedly had said that he would fireball the Brookings Institute, not also something that is really held up by facts, but that gives you an idea of how vilified this man was. And in some ways, Colson resembled that because Colson was this kind of guy for the first 41 years. He was a political analyst. He was a lawyer. He was a guy who was determined to have power and to get his agenda across no matter who he had to step on process. But when this all fell out, and when he was no longer part of the power group in Washington, when everything was crashing down around him, and he was reaching out, God found him. And Charles Colson came to trust. And he was so convicted of his sin, etc., even though he could have gotten off easily, the evidence, etc., and never gone to prison, he actually helped provide. <laughs> he pled guilty and he was sent to prison for seven months. During that time, he grew in God, continued to grow in God. When he got out, he was a changed man. He started Prison Fellowship. 
Now Prison Fellowship International is the largest organization in 120 countries around the world ministering to prisoners and their families. I could go on and on about the different things that Colson has done in his lifetime, the latter half of his life. But the most important thing I think we need to see about Charles Colson was this was a man who was a prisoner. He was a slave of himself. He was a slave of sin. And God set him free. Our memory verse, John 8, 36, says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Say that with me. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, many of us know that. But do we really believe it? Do we really understand what that means? Not just an initial coming to Christ, but completely free. That you and I can be completely free of the effects of sin in our lives. We can be completely free because the Son has set us free. You know, if you've been watching the internet or looking at some of the stuff out there, you might have seen this video that's gone viral out there about a modern day slave auction that took place in Libya. Some reporters had gotten in there with a little camera phone and they're showing this video of these men, these, these African men being sold, bid on and sold as slaves. Uh, I saw another video that a pastor shared with me from Cameroon that came in that was just, or excuse me, Congo, talking also about the, the slaves there, and it was far more graphic than that one. You were seeing beatings and stabbings and things like that. Terrible, terrible things going on. Modern slavery is this, yes. But a more common form of slavery is our slavery to sin. A slavery that is not of the body, necessarily, but is of the soul. You and I deal with it. The people in the world deal with it. And it continues to grab us and it continues to hold us. And the sad thing is, there's freedom available. We have peace. <clears throat> The context of this verse that we just saw is actually in John 8, 33 through 36, and I didn't have it put on the slide, but I want to read it to you. It says, they answered him, these are the Pharisees, he says, we are Abraham's descendants that have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free of you. Many of us in this room have accepted Christ, and we are no longer technically slaves to sin. But still, we live in it. And we live in a world, fr frankly, where bad stuff happens. Bad stuff happens all around us. Bad things that we can't control. Bad things that we ask, where is God in the midst of this? We may not be slaves to sin if we have come to Christ, but we still live in a world where sin abounds and sin still affects us. Where evil is, bad things occur. And the early church saw this firsthand. Acts 12, 1-5. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this meant with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. 
So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. This was an absolute terrible, terrible time for the church. Probably not since the crucifixion of Christ had the believers faced such a disheartening moment as this. Now, we do know that Saul's persecution had taken place. And if you remember from that, Saul had been going house to house practically, dragging Christians out, taking them to be persecuted, putting them in prison, etc. But this time, this killing of James and possibly Peter coming up, would technically have had a much bigger effect. You see, part of the issue is, and why is it worse, is because Herod is involved. The Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, they had the authority, and Paul had been given that authority under Saul, had been given that authority under them, to go out and bring people in, right? To persecute them, to bring them to prison. But they couldn't execute them legally. Not legally. Remember, even Jesus' execution had to go through Herod and through Pilate. But now Herod is involved, and Herod can. Herod can kill them. And you see the killing of James. Not a problem, because Herod has the authority. He has Rome behind him. And now that he realizes, now that Herod realizes, hey, this is going to make me popular among the Jews, because he wants to build his power base, Herod decides, I think I'll do this. I think I'll make this a tradition. In fact, we see from history that these public executions, Herod engaged in them because it boosted his popularity. Not only that, is with the public executions like this incurring favor with the Jews, he built his power base. And in fact, all the way up into AD 66, you saw these executions continuing because of the idea of this nationalist resurgence, this idea of, Jude, the, of Judea coming back into power. And so this was a very big deal for Herod at the time, and it could have been very, very devastating for the church. So, sometimes bad stuff happens. Sometimes we get into situations that leave us wondering, well, where is God in all this? I mean, God has been building the church, right? God has been lifting up this ministry. We've reached out to the Gentiles. Things are happening. And suddenly, James, one of the sons of God, one of the initial biggies, one of the three of the three main disciples is killed by the sword. And Peter, another one of the three, is in prison. I'm sure the church was wondering, God, where are you? What's going on? Have you abandoned us? And sometimes bad stuff happens. And we wonder where God is in all the suffering. Back in February 7, 2008, New Covenant, where the church was meeting at the time, New Covenant Methodist Church, had a fire. And the people in this church, you lost your home. Now you ended up meeting in a choir room, but I'm sure the people at the time were going, where's God in all this? This is a terrible situation. What's happened? Maybe you weren't actively questioned. But I'm sure it was dispirited. I'm sure it was painful. The loss of, of, of this, this place that you were meeting. I remember looking at an article and uh, quoting Pastor Lau talking about home. Wondering where home would be after this. It was a hard time. It's easy to despair when things happen like this. It's easy to despair when life comes crashing down, to give up hope. The thing we need to remember, God is in the miracle business. God is in the miracle business. You know, where we're at now, this building, in many ways is a miracle. This 
church building used to belong to Sunset Heights Missionary Baptist Church. When this congregation was meeting over in the choir room for about a year or so, I think it was, this church was struggling. This church here was had gone down to about 15 people. And they were wondering, you know, what are we going to do? And so they couldn't really keep paying the bills and everything else. The ministry was closing down. And so they decided to put it up for sale. But their desire was they really, really wanted to have a legacy. They really wanted this building to be another church. Well, right across the street, Sunset Elementary. Sunset Elementary is looking at, hey, you know, parking. We can expand. This could, we can use this building maybe or tear it down. I don't know. I mean, there were others that were wanting this land too. But God worked it out so that as soon as they put it on the market on a Wednesday, this church contacted on a Thursday and basically got into it, got this property, paid cash for it. And the church handed over the keys and everything basically. It was an amazing miracle of God because this church had been praying for a home, this church. And the Missionary Baptist Church had been praying for the continuation of the ministry here. And God worked it out. I remember during this time, I had no connection with this church. But I remember hearing about the fire after it happened. And I think I looked on the internet to find out about it. And I got confused. I thought it had been recently. But I remember at the time being so touched by the fact that this church had lost its home. I remember praying for this church. Never dreaming that I would one day be here. Definitely not in this position. It's amazing how God works. It's amazing the way he makes the connections. It's amazing the way everything comes together for his people. God was working a miracle in the early church's life too. Acts 12, 6 through 10. That night, Peter's in prison. That night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He's bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow him, the angel told him. Then the angel said to him, or, Yeah, then the angel said, <laughs> okay, Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing, that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards. They came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. And this was a miraculous event. I want you to picture in your mind just how serious Herod was with keeping Peter for his public execution. I mean, this was his trophy, right? Peter was going to be the, bit, the star of the show. It was going to be a big deal. Herod had assigned four squads of four soldiers, 16 guys, to guard Peter. They were on a rotating schedule, but they were there. And they're very much trained to do this. Peter is chained between two guys. He's sleeping here. He's connected with chains to two different soldiers. I mean, if he moves like this, the other soldier's going to wake up. He moves like this, one soldier's going to wake up. I mean, it's there. Okay? There is no way he can get out of this situation. The guards sleep through it all. They sleep through those chains coming loose. They sleep through the conversation Peter's having with the angel. 
they sleep through him getting up and putting on his clothes and putting on his clothes. They sleep through him passing through the centuries and then passing through the first guard and the second guard and this an iron gate opening. All of that. They sleep through it all. And then go walk down the street and then he leaves him. I mean, it's amazing. It's like something out of a movie. Right? It's a supernatural event. But it's also proving this. That with God, His ways may surprise and delight us. His ways may surprise and delight us. The way God works often surpasses any and all of our expectations. I remember... Um, and I've mentioned before, and I don't really want to go into any details on that. But I remember a, a lady named Carly who was murdered. And the sequence of events leading to that and around that still astonish me today. Because I had been told in Africa to quit my position. And I had been told to go work at a public school. And I'd given God a wish list of what I wanted. I did step out in obedience. And then when I got to the United States, there was no job, right? But that Thursday, Carly was murdered. Her husband got mad at her. They got into a fight, killed her, shot himself. Didn't know Carly. But Carly was a teacher at Camp Verde High School. And they needed a teacher. And all of a sudden, I was there. I wasn't qualified, really, because I didn't have any teacher background other than had been teaching. I had no teaching credentials. And yet, God worked it out for me to be in the right place at the right time. And not only that, to get every single thing on my wish list come about at that school. Now, the thing is, I have to wonder, did God plan Carly's murder? I don't think so. Did he know it was going to happen? Yes. Did he touch my heart in advance with these different things that I was going to get? I mean, it's like, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that the murder and that position fit every single thing that I wanted. The thing is, I just have to let go and say, okay, God, you're in the miracle business. I don't understand. I don't know how it works. I drive myself crazy trying to think of the timeline. But you're in the miracle business. And you know what your plan is. God surprised the early church as well. Acts, 7, Acts 12, 11 through 17. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door! You're out of your mind, they told her, when she kept insisting that it was so. They said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he says, tell James, not James who killed, but James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Now, Peter is at first, is the first to be surprised. And he's first to be delighted. But what follows is almost comic, isn't it? I mean, we look at that story of Rhoda leaving him at the door and 
still knocking, trying to get in, etc. And, and it just seems weird. It seems almost comical. But what is interesting yet sad is the reaction of the believers. And listen, put verse 15 back up. There. They're saying, you're out of your mind. They told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. That was a euphemism, so it must be his spirit. Like, he's dead. What had the disciples been doing? They had been praying. They had been praying. But were they believing? Were they believing that God was going to free Peter? They were praying. But when it happened, they were astonished. When you pray, do you believe that God's going to answer? Do you believe that God really is going to work on your behalf? Or do you pray just because I need to pray? That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm a good Christian boy or girl. Whatever. I'm going to pray. Do you believe it has an effect? Do you believe God listens? Do you believe that God really wants to work on your behalf and has your best interests at heart? Or do you believe it's just, you know, something you did? What do you believe about prayer? Yes, sometimes we pray for something, we pray for healing, we pray for whatever, and God does not answer as we would like. Yes. But that's where our trust in Him and His goodness comes into play. Where we realize that His plan is overarching, that He sees things differently than we do. And that maybe, just maybe, what we're praying for right now is second best. And then he has a much better plan. We need to trust him. We need to trust the person who has set us free. We need to realize that this Lord, this Savior who died on the cross for us, this Lord and Savior who gave us the keys to life, loves us. He wants what's best for us. And that He is going to work to make that happen. Whether we understand it or not. Or we see the picture or not. He set us free. And we need to live that freedom. We need not to be astonished when He does give us, though, what we ask for. After I'd been in Arizona for a while, Camp Verde, God called us back to the mission field, and I had learned to ask for what I wanted. And so when I felt the tug to go back, I asked. I said, God, I know it sounds impossible, but I don't want to have to raise support anymore. I was tired of raising support. Well, that just doesn't happen. You don't go to the mission field without raising support. Except, God hurt. And the Japanese church paid our way. The Japanese church paid everything for us for the time we were over there. God worked a miracle. I mean, quite frankly, I was used to God working in a strange way, so I wasn't as astonished as other Christians around me. I think we're astonished. Yes. God is a miracle worker. God is a guy who loves to surprise us and bless us and show that he's in charge. As believers, God's ways may surprise and they may delight us, but they will always confound his enemies. They will always confound his enemies. Because his enemies don't get it. They don't get the fact that God works in the lives of mankind. They don't believe in him, first of all, and they won't, 
And if they did, did believe in him, they wouldn't believe that he would, had our best interests at heart. The world does not understand God. And so when he moves, non-believers don't recognize his hands and events. And they try to come up with another answer. And that's exactly what we see happening here in Acts 12, 18 through 19. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and he stayed there. Never once was there the idea here that, oh, maybe God freed Peter. No, that can't happen. Has to be collusion. It had to be these guards were paid off. Why they would do that would be ridiculous. They knew the death sentence. The way the Roman army worked is that if you let somebody go, if you were guarding a prisoner and you let them go and they had been accused of a certain crime, you had to pay the same penalty. If it had been robbery, let's say and you let a robber go, then you would have to pay the penalty for robbery. At this point, the penalty for Peter, he was going to be executed. So these guards, they know. There's no way we're letting this guy go. We will be executed. So what would have been the motivation, right? So why would Herod not have seen that? That something out of the ordinary had to have happened. And yet they're not going to look at that. And the world doesn't do that either. When God works in miraculous ways, they say it's coincidence. You know what? I, I've lived long enough and I've walked long enough with God that I really don't believe in coincidence. I don't think God does coincidence. I think God works. He's living and active. He's not some God out here that spun the world into orbit and decided to stand back and just, oh, let's see what happens. I think he's working. I think he's got his hand on your life and my life. But oftentimes, even though he wants to touch your life, oftentimes what happens is we kind of put that mentally out there and we say, well, God doesn't really care about me. I don't really feel the blessings that I want. And so I really think that maybe God doesn't like me anymore. Maybe God's really not involved in people's lives. Some of you say, well, I don't believe that. But sometimes we do, don't we? Sometimes we believe that maybe God just isn't paying much attention to us. And I challenge that. Because I believe that God is. That God does love you. And He does want what's best for you. And He is very, very much concerned with every single thing happening in your life. But we need to trust His hand. And we need to seek His face. And we need to stop trying to be slaves of sin and the world and attitudes. But He's already freed us. Peter was set free physically. But what about James? He was martyred. But he was also set free, wasn't he? Because he was freeing God. And God had a better plan for him. Live, die, thrive, suffer. All is in God's plan. And this life with its joys and its sorrows is less than a blink in the light of eternity. So God asked us this question. Have you been set free? Have you been set free? Maybe you've been coming here. Maybe you've been coming here for a while to be with your friends or your family or whatever. And maybe you've never found that freedom in Christ. Maybe you've heard the sermons, you've heard what people have said, but maybe you have never, ever made that decision to truly follow it. We don't do many altar calls in here. 
But what I want to do with you right now is for those of you like that, that may, maybe you've, you've heard the name of God. You see people who are Christians, but you've never been part of that family. I'm going to pray. I want you to pray along with me. I want you to pray along with me if this is your desire to no longer be an outsider, to be an insider, to no longer wear the shackles, but to be free. Just pray this prayer. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you love mankind, and I thank you that you love me. And Lord, I know that I've been living with the shackles of sin. I, I've been a slave to sin in my life, sin that keeps me away from you. I've been trying to go my own way live my own life under my own terms, Lord, and it's just not working out. I've been spinning my wheels, Lord, and there's an emptiness inside of me that can only be filled by you. And so, Lord, today I accept that free gift, that free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ paid on the cross for. I accept, Lord, the sacrifice as my payment too, as my ticket, Lord, as my birth certificate into your kingdom and into your family. Lord, I accept you as my, as my God, and I accept Christ as my personal Lord, my Savior. I no longer wish you to be a slave. I wish you to be free. Please forgive me now, Lord, of all my sins. And help me walk in the newness of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you're on the journey. Shackles are, are off. If you truly believe what you pray, you are now an insider. You are now part of the family. And I would love to have a chance to help you grow in that family. But maybe there's somebody here, you're part of the family. You have been part of the family, but you still you're still living in a way that you're not free. Maybe you put back on the chains of, chains of slavery. Maybe you've tried to live your life without Christ as a center. You're trying to do it your own way. That way is bondage. Any place that is not with Christ in the center of your life is slavery. You've been set free. So if that's you, I'm going to pray another prayer. You pray it Father God, we live our lives in ways that do not always please you. And I've wandered far from your life, from your center. I've tried to do things my own way. Falling short, Lord, the glory of God. The Lord, I ask to come back to you. I ask that you help me put down these chains to bind me. And help me to once again enjoy the freedom of Christ. To once again walk in the newness of life. To once again be filled with the joy of my salvation. Help me to once again trust you completely. Do not doubt your hand in my life. Help me be renewed in my spirit, Lord, to be who you want me to be. In Christ's name.